If you would, grab your Bibles and open up with me to the book of Philippians. The book of Philippians. Pop quiz, Old or New Testament, Philippians. Now, this doesn't count. That's basically what I just heard. Because that's kind of like old and new. See, I went, to, I went to private school that was Christian. I know how to do that stuff, too. Like, like um, Old or New Testament, the book of Philippians. Yes, and new. Here's another question. Is it a gospel or an epistle? And what in the world's an epistle? It's a letter. Yeah, okay. So think of this as a very long text message. That's what Philippians is. Philippians chapter 3, we're going to be looking at verses 12, 13, and 14 this morning from the New Living Translation. And you may ask, why? Well, one of the values we hold dear as a church is to learn so that we can know how to live. Nobody knows how to live unless you learn. Anyone ever ridden a bike? Okay, Matt Morton. Okay, Matt Morton rode a bike. Um, did you do that your very first try? Matt Morton did. He's amazing. No, 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 no. No, you have to learn. Right. And then you learn how to, to glide, right? Well, life is very similar. Nobody knows everything. There's one guy. His name's Jesus. And he has a book that I firmly believe he believed. Genesis to Revelation was the inspired word of God. You say, how can you even say that? He wasn't alive when Philippians was written. Talk to me after. I'll share with you how that's possible. Because the New Testament claims to be feipnustas. What is that? Breathed out from God himself. And this has more manuscriptual evidence, archaeological evidence, scientific evidence and prophetic evidence to back up that claim than the Iliad and the Odyssey, than your constitution, to be honest with you. We have more scientific, archaeological, prophetic, and manuscriptual evidence that the book that's before you is authoritative, inspired, and inerrant. And that is why it's attacked consistently and constantly by someone who has an agenda that does not care about your well-being. However, God does. Therefore, he's given us his word. And for me, I would love for you to learn the Bible so you can know how to live. That's why we're doing daily devotions, as you saw in the video. You know, my kids and I, we watch the daily devotions every day at 8 a.m. And here's the question I always ask them before we watch them, because they have to give me a report immediately thereafter. You say, wow, that's intense. When you have five and a half kids, you have to be intense, I've learned. Here's the system. Sit up. Have your eyes on the screen. And in order of the way God made us show up on this planet, we are going to share what we heard what we learned, and so now how we're going to live. And I use these L's. I like L's. Listen so that you can learn how to live. Let's say it again, kids. Listen so you can learn how to live. Oh, well, you can say it, too. I was just talking about what goes on with my kids. But anyway. Um, and so then they go down in order. Doom, 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 doom. This is what I heard. This is how I'm going to live. Good. Good. Because most people don't listen. And they don't know how to live. And so here's what we're doing this morning and for the next two Sundays. We're sharing a handful of messages that are singularly focused to that day. And then, Lord willing, by God's grace and hopefully with God's provision, we plan to start a verse-by-verse, chapter-by-chapter study through, not this book, but this is a helpful book on that book, the book of Nehemiah. Nehemiah is our plan, Lord willing, for February, March, April, and May to just walk through that book together with really a theme in seeing Jesus being the central focus. And what Jesus is doing through that book is he's rebuilding 
and restoring. Let me ask you a question, all you Gulf Breezians, all you Pensacolians. Do you think rebuilding and restoring is a good idea for this area? Yeah, we want a bridge, right, man? Like, yeah, I feel like it's a good situation. So not because of that, but there are some marriages that need to be restored. There are some businesses that need to be rebuilt, and not just with a new customer base, but their whole infrastructure is set up to where they're not really caring about the goods of others. They're caring about their own glory. That should change. Rebuild that. Some of the people that are going to be joining us in those messages will have never heard the gospel. So you know what we did? We bought 50 Bibles that are called New Believers Bibles. That's a good title. And in them, it shows you how to listen and learn the Bible so that you can live. I'm hoping and praying that at least 50 new people come to know Jesus until May. Does anyone else think that's a good idea? Yeah, I think it's a good idea. Now, I don't think it's my job to save them. I don't think it's your job to save them. I think it's the Holy Spirit's job to save them. But I do think it's our job to tell them about Jesus, whether you're in Nairobi or you're in Navarre, right? So, but for this Sunday, next Sunday, and the Sunday thereafter, we just have a singular message. So today's message is from Philippians chapter 3. We'll be looking at verses 12, 13, and 14. And here's the message title that I would like to give to today's time. Story and Dream. Father, I thank you so much for the opportunity to be together, both online and in person, to open your word. I pray that you'd help us all to listen to your spirit to learn from your word and be trained how to live for your glory and the good of others. And I pray that in Jesus' name, amen. Reading from the New Living Translation from Philippians chapter 3, allow me to read to you verses 12, 13, and 14. And if you're ready, let me know by saying, Jesus saves. Okay. I don't mean to say that I've already achieved these things or that I've already reached perfection, but I press on to possess that perfection for which Christ Jesus first possessed me. No, dear brothers and sisters, I've not achieved it, but I I, I focus on this one thing. Here's what I focus on. Forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead. I press on, I press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God, through Christ Jesus, is calling us. If there's one thing that the author who wrote this was passionate about, it's the gospel. This gentleman's name at birth was named Saul. He came from an area known as Tarsus. And he was passionate about his position in serving God before he encountered the truth of the gospel. He was a driven man. He was a trained man. He was a capable man. He was an articulate man, and he was ruthless. He was ruthless. When a new sect of Judaism popped up known as the Way that was claiming that Mashiach had come, the Anointed One, the Messiah, the Christos, the Christ, he went at it with a vengeance. In righteous indignation, like the Crusades of old, he went after them, murdered them, hunted them down, killed them. He's Kylo Ren of the New Testament, if that makes any sense. That's who he was, man. He's going after him. And then he had an encounter. You can read about it in the book of Acts. He encountered the risen Savior, Jesus Christ, who asked him this question by repeating his name at least twice. Why do you persecute? me and it scared him because he said who are you lord he recognized the authority of the one speaking to him 
And he said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. And it changed his life. And he took that ruthless nature and by the Spirit of God began to be transformed from ruthless to kindness, but still passionate, still driven, still, still going for it, but now for the gospel. If there's one thing Paul was passionate about, it was the purity of the gospel. Paul was willing to do this, to go toe-to-toe with anyone who messed with the purity, the clarity, and the application of the gospel. If you ever read the Bible, he calls people out. He says, that guy thinks this, he's wrong. It's not. He, he, he would say this, that the fact that it's only through Jesus that we can be forgiven is called justification, and I'm willing to fight for that. Paul would write that the fact that through a life lived for Christ, we're free by his spirit, that's called sanctification. He would fight for that. And both are relationship-oriented things, not theological things. They are theological, that you can be made right in God's sight and live a way that you're free from sin. Yes, it's theological, but it's very relational. How you treat your spouse drastically impacts your sanctification process. It just does. Now, Paul is describing sanctification in this passage. Well, what is that? It's where God is kind of progressively separating a believer from sin to himself and transforming his total life experience towards holiness and purity. In Christ, you are free. What does that mean? You are free from the power and penalty of sin. You are not free to do as your flesh chooses. That's called bondage, to be honest with you. You're free. And we have a a very active part in this sanctification process. My father always trained myself, sister, and brother with this simple idiom. Idiom just means a phrase. Even though it sounds like idiot, don't think of that. It's, It's idiom, not idiot. Idiom. Well, what is it? God has his part and you have your part. And God will not do your part for you. I think that's good advice. Well, what's God's part? Justification, but you have to receive it by faith. He won't do that for you. Sanctification, by his spirit, he'll change you, but you have to surrender yourself to him. It's a both and. How does someone get saved? You know what? I think it's mysterious that a God of love would love Scott Shepherd. Don't you think that's mysterious, Scott? I mean, I... I think it's mysterious that God would love a guy like Lucas Roselius or Daniel Gunthart or Neil Spencer or Regina or Maria, anybody, that God would love us and then by his spirit start changing us. Let me outline that. Let me put that in a systematic theological book and argue with those that don't know if it it was just all God's part or our part. That's called reactive theological discussions. Don't fall into that trap. Salvation is powerfully mysterious. How God can take one who is dead and make them alive. Take someone who is blind and help them see. Take someone who is lost and let them finally feel like they're at home. That's called otherworldly. That's called second birth. And some of you have not experienced that. I can tell because your eyes give you away. There's so much sadness. There's so much pain. There's so much loss. There's so much bondage. And you don't have to live that way. And this is what Paul fought for. You've been designed to be free. You've been designed to be forgiven. You've been designed to have a family. And you've been designed to have a future. That's the gospel. Freedom, forgiveness, a a family, and a future. Who doesn't want that? That's fantastic. There's another F, you know, like, let's just keep it going. Like, anyway. But what is he saying here about this process of us growing? Let me just put this point down. It comes kind of from verses 12 and 13, but let's look at this first one. Here it is. 
We are not made. We are being made. That's what Paul says there, right? He says, listen, in verse 12, I don't mean to say that I've already achieved these things or that I've already reached perfection, but I press on to that perfection for which Christ Jesus has first possessed me. No, dear brothers, I have not achieved it, but rather I focus on this one thing, forgetting the past and looking ahead. Here's the challenge. Here's the, here's the point. You and I were not made. We're being made. Life is a process. Listen to what George Mueller once said. He said, just as a little child is a perfect human being, but still is far from perfect in all his development as a man, so the true child of God is also perfect in all parts, although not yet perfect in all stages of his development and faith. You're still growing as a believer, and that's okay. That means you're in good company. You're, with, you're like the rest of us. Listen to what Charles Spurgeon, the prince of preachers, once said. But while the work of Christ for us is perfect, and it were presumption to think of adding to it, the work of the Holy Spirit in us is not yet perfect. It is continually carried on from day to day, and we will need to be, conti- and will need to be continued throughout the whole of our lives. Let me just ask you this basic question. Anyone that's a believer or an unbeliever this morning, can I ask you a question? Do you need Jesus? Everyone still needs Jesus, <laughs> yes. Listen to old Billy Graham. I like it because it's short and sweet. Listen to what Billy said. Each life is made up of mistakes and learning, waiting and growing, practicing patience and being persistent. We will not be there until we're there. And there is a place called heaven. And one of the guys that trained me had this phrase, and this is what he always used to say, Neil... It ain't heaven till it's heaven. So stop looking for heaven where it ain't heaven. Oh, that makes sense. So my marriage isn't going to be heaven? No. My church isn't going to be heaven? No. You mean Gulf Breeze and its access to Pensacola that's not going to feel heavenly? No. You live in a place called earth that's riddled by sin. You are not made. You're being made. Hopefully that helps your shoulders relax a little bit. Well, you, know, you don't have to be perfect. There's a guy that hung on that thing. He was the perfect one. And he said that if we place our faith in him, we have his perfection. That's a good exchange. I got nothing. You got everything. How about we trade? Sure. Jesus puts his thumbs up. That's amazing. Well, then if you look at verses 13 through 14, listen to what Paul says. He says, dear brothers and sisters, I've not achieved perfection, but this one thing I do, I forget the past, I look forward, and I press on to reach the end of the race. He says this thing that I find very interesting in verse 13. I focus on this one thing. Here's the second point for today. The less you do, the better you'll do it. Complexity is more of a weakness. Sometimes your body's very complex. I mean, have you ever, it's complex. (sighs) At times, complexity can be more of a weakness than a strength. Elimination is essential to concentration. That's why Paul said this one thing I do. One person once said this, though, but does that really work? Like, my to-do list has a to-do list. Like, what do you mean, this one thing I do? Well, it doesn't mean that Jesus is at the top of your list every day. Well, i got to start my list today, and Jesus is at the top. Put him up the list. Nope. It's a one-thing mentality. It's not a list, it's a lens. That's how you look at this. Say, what do you mean by that? Sometimes we approach life as a big list. And it's a problem to put God at the top and then leave him there at the top and do the rest of our stuff in our own strength. God isn't the first thing I do. He's my one thing. See, a lens is something through which you see everything. Seek first the kingdom of God and all these things will be added to you. That's something Jesus said. Seek God as you try to love your spouse. As you try and serve under the leadership of your overseer. As you fold the laundry. As you do the dishes. Whatever you do, eat or drink, whatever you do, do it unto Jesus. That's a lens lifestyle, not a list lifestyle. 
Everything. In everything, I'm practicing the presence of God. God's with me. Through the thick and thin, through the ups and downs. And I trust him. And when, when that which comes which does not make sense, I can trust that when life seems chaotic, Anyone think 2020 was chaotic? Anyone think the start of 2021 has been a little chaotic? When life seems out of control, I can stay self-controlled because I know who's in control. God, how do you stay self-controlled? Because I know there is a plan. And I have read this book. And I trust the character of God. I don't have to know every detail. Can I be honest with you? God doesn't share with me every detail. He just doesn't. I'm on a need-to-know basis with God. And it seems like a lot of times I don't need to know. But I do know this. That darkness is coming. But greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. That Jesus said that all authority has been given to me. Think about that. Who controlled this? And who, who spun this? And let me go down the rabbit hole. I do know this. All authority and power has been given to Jesus. You're saying he did all that? No, I'm not saying that. I'm saying he knows. And there's a plan to expose that which is evil for evil. And to allow God to be God. Not, not to put our trust into some human, some system some great new thing, but to put our trust in Jesus and to say, come what may, Jesus is king. I can trust him. And God is more interested in your character than he is your comfort or even your 401k. Can you believe that? He cares more about how patient you are than about how much money you have. And if your investments turn a good profit, God, he cares about that. I think he does. He loves you. But if you're a bitter, warped, frustrated person, I think he cares more about that than he does about, can I buy that boat? Like, you know what I mean? Like, priorities, man. Anyway, in verse 13, he says this interesting thing. Forget the past and look forward to, to ahead. What does that mean? Should we disrespect the past? No, no, no. We don't disrespect the past. Let's put this up on the screen. Honor the past, but live in the moment. What matters most, let me have your attention, let me see your eyes, is now. This is what matters. It's 949 on Sunday, January 10th, 2021. You get one shot at this. You're never going to get it back. Are you leaning in to the moment that you're in? Or are you leaning back and thinking about how much longer till I can get out of here? You're missing it. Life is meant to be lived. That's the purpose of life. It's not meant to be thought about what's coming for you or what came for you. It's meant to be right where you are. That's when you're most alive. That's true biologically. That's true spiritually. What matters most is what's here now. And this is what you need to do. Learn from the past. Honor what God has done. But live in the moment. And steward your future well through good planning. You say, planning? Yes, it's okay to set forth. You know what? After this, I might walk out that door. That's a plan. You know, after this, I might stand up. You just made a plan. After this, I might get in my car and turn it on. Can you believe it? You're planning all day long. A plan is a wonderful tool, but a terrible master. That's why some of you are afraid to make plans. Because you go, I don't want to be hemmed in by anything. Ah, oh, foolish. A plan is a tool, not a master. God is master. You can make tools and, okay, and God, you know, here's what I think about God. He don't really care about your plans. <laughs> you may kind of go, I'm going to do this and that, and then I'm going to buy and sell, and then I'm going to go here and there. And you go, man, you may not even make it to the end of the day. But at least a plan gives you some mile markers. And let me just have your attention. Let me see your eyes. There's nothing wrong with that. There will be those that tell you there is. But I'm here to tell you, man makes his plans, but God directs his steps. But a plan is just, it's just thinking clearly. 
Just writing, that's all writing is. This one thing I do, I live in the moment. I kind of barely remember yesterday. (laughs) I'm right here. A lot going on right now. I got to focus on where I'm at. Who knows what tomorrow holds, but I'm thankful I know the one who holds it. Last point for this morning, then there'll be a little bit of application. Comes from verse 13 and 15, and I'll just give you the phrase. Here it is. The longer you've been at it, the more you need to work it. Say, what do you mean by that? Well, right in between verses 13 and 15, what verse do you think is there? It rhymes with Mortine. 14. Listen to what verse 14 says. I press on to the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize. Say, what do you mean? Paul's most likely near, not the beginning of his ministry when he wrote this. And you know what happens to most people as they get to a season of life of success? Ah, I don't have to push the gas pedal anymore. I don't have to work as hard. I don't have to give my all anymore. You know what I think? I think God's into retirement more than he is retirement. Say, what do you mean by that? There are discernible seasons in our life. There have been in mine. We're like, hey, I did something for a little while. It had a start, middle, and end date. And then God rehired me. Now you do this. And it had a start, middle, and end date. Now you do this. And it had a start, middle, and end date. And the best thing you can do for yourself and all those around you is recognize that if I'm breathing, God's got something for me. And I'm open to it. And I'm letting go of the past. I'm living in the moment. I can't wait for the future. You ever heard of Ugwe? Yeah, I didn't think so. He's the turtle on Kung Fu Panda. You ever heard that movie? Ugwe had this quote, yesterday is history, tomorrow is a mystery. Today is a gift, that's why it's called the present. Uh, yeah, something like that. And I thought, that's, a good, that's, not, that's not Bible, that's Ugwe, so don't take it too far. But, like, but there's something to that. This is what Paul's saying right here. It's tempting to think that you'll eventually not be tempted anymore. Paul had been a Christian for 30 years when he wrote this. 30 years. And you know what he's saying? I can't wait to plant some more churches. I can't wait to write more letters. A.W. Tozer has a book called Rut, Rot, or Revival. You are in one of those places today. We need to rethink maturity. The Bible seems to indicate that maturity is something you're always pursuing but never reach. And as you get closer to the finish line, you don't relax, you reload. You press in. And I, can I just say something? I will be 40 this year if I make it to September 16th. I may not make it. But if I do, I would like to say this as a 40-year-old individual. My generation needs the generation ahead of me. We need you to invest into your children and into your grandchildren. Those that are in my generation, here's what I would say. Stop living for yourself and invest in the generation behind you. Those that are in my generation, you're in like the middle of life, and it's all about building that career, getting that vacation, getting that kid in school, making sure the braces are on. Nothing wrong with that. We like straight teeth. Don't misunderstand what I'm saying. But if you're still living for yourself, you're missing the boat. Life is a mist, man. Eleven years ago today, I showed up in Destin for the first time. January 10th, 2010. With a one-year-old, a Bible, and a guitar, and eight people were sitting there. Eleven years ago. I remember that day... Very clearly, because my daughter, my oldest daughter, had just turned one. She turned 12 on Friday. And that feels like a morning mist. Where did that go? I'll tell you where it went. Every single day, I was given 24 hours, just like you were. And that season had a beginning, middle, and end. It ended on April 29th, 2019. I didn't know when it was going to end. I didn't even want it to begin, to be honest with you. 
what God did. It was a discernible season in my life. I'm in a new season. How long will this last? I don't know. I don't know. But I'm here now. And I want to give my all to now. I have no clue what's coming for me on Monday. But I know that at 9.57, I'm supposed to be talking to you sweet people, right? That's what I'm doing. But I don't know what 9.59 holds. I'll probably still be talking to you. If, you know, 10.59, no, I won't be. You'll be out of here. Don't worry. <laughs> but here's the deal. <sighs> we are not made. We are being made. The less you do, the better you'll do it. Honor the past, but live in the moment. And the longer you've been at it, the more you need to work it. Say, so how does this relate to your sermon title? This makes no sense to me. You said your sermon title was Story and Dream. Yes. Yes. I did. Philippians chapter 3, verse 14 is my life verse. It's not the verse I chose for myself. It's the verse that was chosen for me and put on a plaque and my name was put on it. Okay, well, that's, that's my life verse. That's what I'm going to do then. I'm going to press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God through Christ Jesus is calling us. That's my job. My name is Neil. It means champion. My middle name is Stephen, which he was the first martyr. And my last name is Spencer, which means steward. So let me just steward the things that God gives me, not make my life about myself, and help me to champion the cause of Jesus. That's what I'll do, because that's the name I was given. Now, don't get too weird about that. Don't go into your name and go, okay, well, my name means the wrathful hater. So everybody I meet, I'm going to just, you know, like, no. I'm just saying, in my life, this is the way that I did it, but I don't know who you are. I mean, you got, you got, I got, I got so much problems up here. I can't deal with your problems. I got, I got so many going on. I got five and a half kids. Like, man, there's a lot going on. But I will say this. Okay, Lord, if that's what I feel like you've called me to do, what should I do? Um, seek first the kingdom of God. Okay, I'll do that. Started that at the age of 19. And more and more, I started to get interested in church. I kind of grew up in it. I know a guy who started a church. And I thought, well, I like church now. What, what should I do with it? And I don't know. But I do know this, that this is what I feel called to do with my life. This is my story. I say, well, what is this? I'm not, I don't got time to tell you. We wrote it out there. We did two messages on this. One was called 1041, and one is called New Seasons. And if you're savvy, you remember this message, Neil, you gave back like three months ago. Yes, I did. The same message, the same points, almost verbatim. Because I felt as I prayed about this morning, the Lord said, I need you to remind someone of this. Okay, it's embarrassing to share the same message twice, but I'll do it. They'll think I don't know how to write a second message, Lord, but I'll do it. That's what you say. My story is one of learning how to fall and get back up. Anyone else ever fallen and learning how to get back up? Okay, a couple of you. Good. Awesome. You rode a bike once. Like, we all do that. I make a lot of mistakes. But following Jesus is not one of them. Getting married to Cece is not one of them. Moving here to be a part of this church is not one of them. I feel like this is where the Lord has us. And as the Lord has us here, I want to see us preach the gospel so that people can experience new life and be baptized. So they can learn to worship in song and life. They can learn how to pray in the spirit and in power. That they would learn and live the Bible. That they would receive communion. That they would live in community that they would live to give and serve and live on mission. That's what I'd like to see happen. I'd love to see us live new life in Jesus. I'd love to see us love God together. I'd love to see us connect together. I'd love to see us live on mission together. I'd love to see us do that spiritually, organically, and strategically. So how's all that going to work? I don't know. I'm just a kid from here, like you or wherever you're from. But like this is how I think a way it could work, a horizontal growth plan. It's just a thought. You say, well, what is that? Get saved. Declare that through baptism. Come to this thing that we just put together on January 31st, First Steps. It's a book that's come together from a lot of different people. Daniel Gunthorpe, Chris Hodges, Neil Spencer, 
John Spencer. Um, I don't even know if I could list all the names that co-opted this. Nobody owns this. This is like from our church. And Tony Skaggs read it the other day. Tony's somewhere. He's wearing a nice green jacket. There he is right there. He said, I wouldn't take away or add anything to this. Okay, Tony's been around a long time. Well, I like what Tony has to say. Um, we want you to take first steps. Well, what are, what are the first steps? Discover who Coastline is. Discern your unique design. Develop a connection to our church that's personal, and then learn how to deploy into life. I feel like that's helpful. To discover, discern, develop, and deploy. Those are good, simple steps. Now let's do it all in one night with a free dinner and dessert. I think that sounds great to me, man. I ain't got much time. So one dinner with a free dessert and dinner? Sign me up for that. I'll be there. January 31st. I'd love to invite you into that. I would love to invite you to join a connect group. You say, well, what's a connect group? We wrote another book. The, the next book is what a connect group is, why it exists. There we go. Your role as a connect group leader, should you so choose to be one. How to start a connect group, and then helpful information. Tonight at 5 o'clock, if you're interested in being a part of a, a group where basically you get together in an environment and learn how to apply the Bible, focus time of personal prayer where you can actually pray with one another, dialogue about the scriptures. Listen, I love what all of you guys think, but right now if we try and have a dialogue, it's going to be a problem. This has to be a monologue. That's what a service is designed for. But a small group? I want you to talk. Feel free to like talk about Jesus, and if, you're, if your hip's giving you problems, talk about that to people. They want to know. They want to pray for you. A small group. And to the best of our ability, we as a church staff would love for you to learn how to live well. So we, we'd love to give you an option every day to be in the Word of God through a two-minute video and a small Bible reading. Believe it or not, we want to help. We'd love to be a part of your life daily, Monday through Friday, Saturday. That's the Sabbath. We're going to take a break. But anyway, um, Sunday, we're here. Monday through Friday, man, join us online for these devotionals. Midweek, be in a small group. And here's my opinion. Here's my dream. Here's my opinion. Physical health does not happen one day at the gym and six days of cheeseburgers. I am proof of that, man. And this is what I would say. Spiritual health does not happen by sitting in a row on a Sunday. It's part of it. But come and learn how to love God here on a Sunday morning. How do I do that? Sing. Pray. Learn the Bible. Receive communion. Give. Serve. Do those things with us on a Sunday, every week, whether online or in person. Join us. Partner with us. And then in the middle of your week, get together with some other believers for encouragement, for relationship, for dialogue on the scriptures, and to learn how, how, how can we be a blessing to our community? Do we have to wait for, a, for the fall fest to happen? Or could we actually go knock on our neighbor's door and go, hey, do you know Jesus? Can I just pray for you? Here's what I've learned. We went around our little cul-de-sac a couple weeks ago and just handed out cookies and an invite to the uh, Christmas Eve service. And you know what happened? Nobody threw an egg at me. Nobody cussed me out. Nobody started to like, oh, I'm going to kill you. No, you know what they did? Hey, thanks for these cookies. Uh, we might come to this service. You know what I found that's interesting? People are waiting to be invited. And you're the invitors. So don't be afraid. Bake some cookies if you have to. Even if you have to go to Walmart and just, hey, well, yeah, here's some cookies. Like, you don't even have to bake them, you know? But kindness goes a long way. Kindness goes a long way. But you don't want to be outside of community. There's safety in numbers. Have you ever heard that before? I want to ask you to be a part of a connect group this winter. You're going to hear more and more information about it. We are going to have... Some of our groups be sermon-based groups. As we go through the book of Nehemiah, this commentary is awesome because you know what it has already in it? All the small group questions for your small group. So you can know what the questions are ahead of time. So you could study like six weeks ahead, and when your connect group leader says, okay, here we come to that question, you go, well, theologically, I think that this, you know, you could be ready. You can impress all, if you're single and there's a girl there you want to date, this is how you impress her, right here. Be a part of a connect group. Learn how to live daily. 
or don't. Don't. Just sit here and think you're going to get better. (laughs) Think that just by coming and listening to a sermon, that growth is happening. Billy Graham called that the most dangerous thing to do in America, to listen to a sermon. And I'm trying to tell you, stop self-deceiving. Everyone in the South is a Christian, but no one is. Except for you nice people, right? Right. But you know what I'm saying? That like in the South, there there tends to be this kind of like, it's a cultural thing. We kind of go to church. It's just something I do. You want me to serve? You want me to give? You actually want me to talk to people? I don't. Jesus does. It's in the Bible. I have no opinion. My opinion is this. And the Bible says, sing to the Lord. The Bible says, serve one another. The Bible says, don't forsake the assembling. Those are not the NIV. I mean, they are. There's a new international version, but it's not Neil's interesting version. It's the Bible. All this is, is like the gospel, the great commandment, the great commission with a little bit of organization. That's all this is. This is my dream. You say, what is your dream? My dream is you. My dream is you living life to the fullest. My dream is you not being alone. My dream is you fully in love and know what it's like to be pursued by one who loves you. My dream is that you would wake up every single day with purpose. That's what I want for you. I want you to do well. Say, how do I do that? I don't know my next step. That's a great question. I'm going to invite Daniel Gunthorpe and David Yeager up to the front. They're going to give you the answer to that. No, they're not. But I am going to invite you up to the front because I created a tool that may help. It may not. You may look at this and go, this is stupid. That's cool. You can, like, start a fire. It's hot. It's cold outside. Use it to do that. But they're going to start passing this out to down the rows, however you guys think. If you need help, you can talk to somebody else. Bruce is there. You know, uh, Jimmy Fowler's over there if you feel like you need help. Lucas is here. Lucas likes to hand out things. He could pass out some papers. But I think a lot of people want to live the dream. They want to know what it's like to live life to the fullest. They desire to know God in a loving relationship, not a legalistic relationship. They desire real, genuine, authentic connection and community. I think they desire purpose and mission and knowing how they're uniquely designed and where they fit in this community and this community. I think you're designed for life. I think you're designed for love. I think you're designed for connection. And I think you're designed for purpose. And I think I'm not your answer, man. (laughs) I think Jesus is. But I do think that our pastoral team would love to come alongside you and assist you in any way we possibly can. Spiritually, we'd love to see you healthy and growing. You say, how do we do that? Let me read to you this little one sheet of paper that I last updated on Christmas Eve. This is what it says. This is an opportunity. Look at it as that. Here it is. What's wrong with living the dream? I believe it's a good and a godly thing to dream and to journey after the dreams that God places in our hearts, heads, and hands. What kind of dreams? About Ferraris? Well, keep reading. That ultimately bring God glory and good to others. There's the filter. I believe we all have, listen to this, the potential to have life-giving relationships and accomplishments. We all have the potential to live the dream. Please listen to this next line. We all have potential, yet potential has an expiration date. As we journey through life, we pick up attitudes, beliefs, and we make choices that at times are not helpful but in fact begin hurting us and the dream God has for our lives. How do you know that? Well, I think it sometimes is evidenced in physical, mental, and spiritual health. I believe that if not addressed, it's possible that these unhealthy dynamics 
are more than just a season we're presently going through, but could be who we are becoming and ultimately who we become. I would love the opportunity to be helpful in your journey. It's been said that if you know where you've been, you can better discern where you're going by hearing your story and your dreams and your educational and work experiences, I believe I or a member of our team, you could write that in there, may be helpful to you as you discern your best next step in your journey. Journey is called life. Everyone's on a journey, man. Well, here's what I'd say. As a fellow human being in process, that's me. Remember, like right here, I, I, I'm being made. I'm not made. I'm in process just like, I don't know everything. I'm not the answer, man. Here's what I'd like to suggest. This is where it gets real. Eight days from today. That would be next Monday. Take six days to write and rewrite and one day to pray over it. Listen, if Jesus created in six days and rested on the seventh, or God the Father, so can you. I would like you to please share with me an up-to-date copy of your resume and a thorough and thoughtful response to these two questions. Well, what is it? Your story. Who are you? Well, how do, I want, how, how do you want me to tell you my story? This is how. This is very specific. Looking through the lens of hindsight. Oh, the past. Yes. With thanksgiving. Please listen to that EQ. Don't look, look at the past at the shoulda, woulda, couldas. Like, remember Uncle Rico from Napoleon Dynamite? Just want to go back to 1982, man, that the coach would have put me in. No, 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 no. That's called the shoulda, woulda, coulda. Not, not that lens. The lens of thanksgiving. Hey, he hurt me. She stole from me. This opportunity was given to somebody else. My dad abused me. Yeah, I know that. I'm not saying gloss over the pain, but I'm saying this. God works all things together for good. Can you start to process the past through the lens of thanksgiving? For some of you, you start to physically react to that because there's trauma there. I'm not seeking to to disrespect that or belittle that. But I am asking you to look back through the lens of thanksgiving in what way? And and here's my question. Here it is. What's God been showing or doing in your life over the last 20 years, 5 years, 12 months, and the last 30 days? Secondarily, share with me your dream. Say, what is this dream? I'm going to define it in just a second. Give me a couple more minutes. I'm almost done. Looking through the lens of foresight and finance, because life's all about money. If you don't got money, it's never going to work. No, it doesn't say that. It says through the lens of foresight and faith. Some of us don't know how to live by faith. We know how to live by reason and resource. That's why you're not alive. You live by faith. What's the dream of your life in the next 30 days, 12 months, five years and 20 years? And here's the question. What's your strategy to realize these dreams? Because God has a part and so do you. Praying and believing the best for you. And there's contact information. You say, why do you share this with us today? Listen to this quote by Malfurus. Now, I can explain that later. But he says this, vision or a dream is a clear and exciting picture of the future. How how can you write a picture of the future? It's future. One pastor says this, the dream makes the mundane matter, provides a reason to live and the reality that you matter to the success of that vision or dream. Listen, let me have your attention. Let me see your eyes. When you stop dreaming, you start dying. You need to have purpose. Now, here's your purpose. It's called Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20, that you would join Jesus in his mission to preach the gospel and make disciples of the whole earth. May may I please have your attention. That's why you exist. You are not here to build your portfolio. You are not here to to be that good mom and dad. You are not here to be that good business person. You are not here. What you say, those are all, what do you mean? You are here to be a good disciple of Jesus as you're a good mom and dad, as you build that portfolio. There's nothing wrong with pursuing accomplishment. Remember that was in the little dream description there. 
what the accomplishment and the position must be for God's glory and the good of others. If not, you're a degree off your target and you're going to miss it. And you're going to wake up in shackles, not live in the dream. And you need a filtration. What do you mean? Set a 30-day goal. Because then there's accountability. Set a five-year, a 10-year, and a 20-year, and make sure all of those align so you're moving in the direction you want to move. If you don't do that, no wonder you're chasing your tail. Now listen, as soon as you start to move forward, here's what happens. There's names that are known in heaven, and then there's names that are known in hell. That's what some, one of my mentors once told me. And he said, Neil, if you start to move against the will of the enemy, expect attack. Because those that are not attacked by the enemy are those that are going in the same direction. And so if you start to push the envelope, no, 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 we don't want churchianity, we want Christianity. Expect to get hit. If you say, listen, I'm not here to fulfill some man's dream. I'm here to fulfill the dream that's in the Bible. Expect to get hit. If you're here to help position other people to experience life, love, connection, and purpose, expect to be maligned, slandered, misunderstood. You know why? Because that's what happened to Jesus. And Jesus said, look, man, if they hated me, they're going to hate you. An attack will come from within and from without. But the interesting thing about the church is we, sh we, we shoot our wounded you know what I mean by that? Like when, when a Christian makes mistakes, they're done. Wait a second. I thought this was a ministry of reconciliation, not a ministry of perfection. Because there's still religiousness in all of us. I am us. I'm not, I'm not a, even though I have to stand up here so you can see me, I'm right there with you. Does that make sense? Like I, I, I need Jesus for every moment, for every moment, because I know me. I know my proclivities and weaknesses, and they are many. I need Jesus. I need his Holy Spirit to change my mind. I need him every second that I breathe. And so you say, why did you give us this? I don't know. I felt like I was supposed to. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it was the pizza I ate yesterday. There was a lot of pizza at that birthday party, but... But I, I, I've seen this to be helpful for some people. Maybe for you, it's just kindling for your fire this afternoon. That's cool. At least I helped you start your fire, right? Like, but maybe this is a tool that you could go, I'm going to think about this. Because to be honest with you, Neil, I'm at a point in my life where I don't know what my next step is. And you know what I'd say? Me either, man. Like, I'm right there with you. <laughs> but I'm, I'm trying to take steps, and I feel like this gives me a lot of clarity for, for at least for me, what my spiritual, organic, or strategic step is. But there's more to life than just this. And I'm not the guru. There's other people that can offer you. No, but here's what this is meant to do. It's meant to be an opportunity for you to actually discern your next step. Because as soon as you get some clarity to the past, and maybe some potential for the future, you may say, oh, I think the Lord is leading me to do this. Cool, talk to your mom and dad about it. Talk to your brothers, sisters in Christ about it. Read the Bible. See if the Bible has anything to say about it. Um, talk to somebody smarter than yourself. But most likely, I think the Holy Spirit will tell you. Because there's no mediator between you and, and God. But I think community is helpful. And I think there's safety in numbers. And I think it's good to process things when you're taking steps with others. That's what I do. But I'm not the smartest person around. But anyway, there's a lot more that I could say but I don't think I should. I feel like this is a good place to end this. And I would just say this. My dream is that Lily, Lucy, Layla, Liam, and Leonidas would experience life, love, connection, and purpose to the fullest. That's what I want. I want CC to be stoked. Because here's what I found. When mama's happy, I'm happy. Like when... And here's what I want. In the same way, you have your own families, you have your own children, you have your own people that you like and people that you endure, you know. Um, God wants you to, to, like, to, to like help them experience life. I think he does. It's the gospel. I think he wants them to be loved.
We read that this week in the, in the daily reading. Remember, I think it was from Friday that like um, to love one another is the greatest, like the whole law and prophets hang on that. And I wear this little bracelet to help me remind me of this. When I was a kid, there was this question called, what would Jesus do? See that? What would Jesus do? Well, somebody said this. Here's what he would do. He would love first. Man, that's convicting every second of the day. I mean, I got to love first, but I was wronged. That don't matter. Jesus was wronged. He would love first. Can you imagine what Gulf Breeze would look like if this group of people just said, well, I'm going to try that. <laughs> like, I'm just going to try and love first. And it might start looking different. The bridge will still be out. But like, you know, at least people have a smile on their face. You know, like, um, yeah, that's it. I shouldn't say any more. Um, I'm going to invite Rob and the team up. They're going to help lead us in worship. But as they do, let's stand. And um, I think what I'm supposed to say as I leave you today is, um, is simply this, that you need to know that God likes you, that he likes you. You need to know that Jesus loves you. You need to know that you are not too far gone to be forgiven or to have purpose. You need to know that you matter in God's sight and you need to know that this church needs you that if you call this church home we need you you're wanted here we, we want you to be involved on a Sunday morning and learning the Bible and singing and serving and giving being a part of the community because we're trying to steal something from you no because that, that's what this guy that wrote the Bible wants he, he says this is helpful for you we, we, we really want you to be a part of a small group. Over the next couple of weeks, you're going to find out so much information about them. You're like, okay, I get it. Be a part of a connect group. If I'm not, I'm going to hell. No, just teasing, just teasing. But, but I get it. You want me to be in a, in a connect group. It's healthy for me. You're going to hear a lot about that. We want you to be in a connect group because I, I think it's really good for you. I think you know, eventually you're actually going to like it. Like, it's just an opinion. And lastly, I want you to learn daily. Man how to see work as worship and not your identity. How to, how to get in the Bible every day and find it to be life-giving and be like, man, I'm, I'm like feeding my spirit right now. Daily, midweek, and on the weekend, we want to be helpful in your journey.